go ahead, get out of the way here and pass you over to our wonderful expert, Dr. Finn Ballard. With that being said, there you go, Finn. Thank you, Seku. Hi, everybody. Good evening from Berlin. I recognize a lot of names and quite some faces here. Hi to those of you I know and for those of you I've not yet met. Hi, everybody. My name is Finn. I'm from Ireland, but I live here in Berlin, Germany. And here I lecture on Berlin history, German history, teach and guide lots of tours with context and also work on the context conversation. So this evening, this is a little bit of a teaser of the conversations for those of you who are new to them. They are normally much longer, 90 minutes long. Uh, you'll be pleased to know you only have to listen to me this evening for 30 minutes. But of course, we have an incredibly fascinating topic, to say the least, unveiling Oppenheimer's legacy, our talk's been called. Ah, Rona's not getting any audio. Okay, gosh, what's happening there? Hmm. Is that on your end, maybe, Rona Tseku? Uh, yeah, it's on. It's. Uh, I think it's on Rona's end because I think we. Okay, most... Rona, you just have to maybe fiddle around there with your own Ooh. buttons, and <laughs> bits and pieces. I'll just keep talking, and you can. Oh well, Rona, you can't hear me say this. What am I doing? Wait a second. I'll just write to Rona quickly. <laughs> then I can write to her. Uh, sorry, guys. It's okay. I'm. I got it. Uh, on your end. <laughs> hopefully Rona will figure that out shortly but it seems like everybody else is okay try again Rona okay sec you can hopefully sort that out but hi everyone good evening hope all the rest of you can hear me hope Rona will soon be able to hear me as well and thanks so much for joining me for this short discussion of the life and career of J. Robert Oppenheimer. So what's prompted this talk this evening, these live streams always have a topical association is of course the brand new movie of which you've maybe heard directed by Christopher Nolan. So I wanted to begin in fact with talking about the movie itself. So as you see, the movie is coming out in just a couple of weeks on the 21st of July, at least the US release. It's by indeed Christopher Nolan. Like like I say, you might know of him. I'll just speak about the movie for a moment before I get into, in, into talking about the life of Oppenheimer. But Christopher Nolan, as you might know, has made a lot of blockbuster movies. He's the director of the Dark Knight Batman movies, but also a couple of movies pertaining to World War II. Well, in this case, Oppenheimer and also the movie Dunkirk is by Christopher Nolan. This is, in fact, the first narrative as in non-documentary movie about the life of Oppenheimer. As you see there top left, it does star Killian Murphy, the Irish actor whom you might know from Peaky Blinders, quite a lookalike of Oppenheimer, I must say. And Murphy and Nolan have worked together fairly extensively. So this is actually the sixth movie which Killian Murphy has shot with Christopher Nolan. Also in the movie is Emily Blunt, Matt Damon, Kenneth Branagh, Robert Downey Jr., Tom Conti plays Albert Einstein. And the cinematographer on this movie is Heute van Heutema, who does often collaborate with Christopher Nolan. And he also worked, for instance, on the James Bond movie Spectre. Oppenheimer is technically, te technically, technologically, a very, very innovative movie indeed. You can see IMAX down there. It's been shot in large format film, IMAX format. That doesn't mean you have to see it in an IMAX cinema, but you certainly can do. You can see it on a regular screen, but that large formatting means it has an extremely high resolution, so it'll be extra sharp and rich. And like I say, if you get a chance to see it in an IMAX, perhaps you can take that. It's also the first ever movie which uses black and white IMAX footage. And the movie was shot largely on location at University College Berkeley, where Robert Oppenheimer taught. They also built a whole 1940s style town for filming, and they did also use whatever possible real explosions as opposed to CGI computer generated imagery. Reports so far from the preview screenings are that viewers, well, at least Christopher Nolan says, have been deeply affected by the movie, found it uh, profoundly affecting and, well, indeed, devastating, here says the headline. <laughs> 
But indeed, everybody, who was this man, J. Robert Oppenheimer, who oversaw the most destructive project, of course, in the history of human scientific endeavor, and yet the project which brought an end to the most devastating war in human history, and of course, launched the world into the nuclear age. Let's talk a little bit about the life of this man. So Julius Robert Oppenheimer was born in New York in 1904. His father was German, actually, strictly speaking, Prussian, a Jewish emigre who had arrived in the States with very, very little, but who had made a fortune in the textile business. And Oppenheimer's mother, Ella, was a painter, and the Oppenheimer family home on Riverside Drive in Manhattan was full of artworks. They had a Picasso or two. They had a cook, servants, a chauffeur, and both Robert and his younger brother Frank were prodigious students. I'll refer to Frank Oppenheimer again briefly later, but he also became a physicist and he would go on to found the Exploratorium Science Museum in San Francisco way in the 1960s, much, much later, that is. But sticking to the childhood for a moment, when Robert was five before even the birth of his younger brother, Frank, the family took a holiday in Germany, and there Robert was able to meet his paternal grandfather, who gave him a collection of mineral rocks and this sparked a fascination in the young Robert. He joined the New York Mineralogical Club at the age of 11 and actually presented his first scientific paper there soon thereafter. Uh, what a prodigious child. And yeah, I suppose prodigious is really the word. He was even fast tracked through school. He missed a couple of years at the New York School for Ethical Culture, prodigious, uh, prestigious, I should say, academy indeed. There he was learning ethics as well as science, literature. He learned four foreign languages. He had apparently a straight A record. He was always rather frail, though, and rather sickly. He fell severely ill with dysentery just before starting college. And in a bid to go off to recover, let's say, to take him on a cure, his parents sent him to New Mexico. And of course, that part of the world will play heavily into Oppenheimer's later life. But this trip to New Mexico imbued him certainly with a real love of that landscape and also, in fact, a real love of horse riding. Uh, that passion stayed with him. And then at the age of just 18, Oppenheimer went on to study at Harvard. Initially, he did study chemistry. He had additional courses too in history and literature. In fact, he was a keen writer of poetry. But above all, he took courses in physics. And physics became, of course, his true passion. The degree should have taken a bit longer, but he studied overtime and completed his degree ahead of schedule in three years but really, in those days, not America quite, but rather Europe and Britain were really where the action was happening when it came to physics, where the most groundbreaking research was taking place. And so after Oppenheimer graduated from Harvard, he would go on to England and there he took up work at the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University that was directed by Ernest Rutherford, a scientist from New Zealand who's remembered to history as the father of nuclear physics. And it was at the Cavendish Laboratory where scientists would first split the atom, creating the process of fission whereby nuclear energy is released. Well, there at his time in the Cavendish Laboratory, at his time in Cambridge, Oppenheimer began to learn about quantum mechanics, the study of matter and energy of how atomic particles exist and interact with each other. Well, I must say on a personal level there, he did find himself really overwhelmed. He really found that for the first time, he was not the top of the class. He couldn't quite keep up with the workload. He certainly did not win too many friends at his time in during his time at Cambridge. In fact, he got into a huge amount of trouble. He was nearly kicked out of the school. It's quite remarkable really that he wasn't after leaving a poisoned apple, an apple he had laced with some rather noxious 
precious chemicals on the desk of his tutor, a guy called Patrick Blackett, who, as you can imagine, was no particular fan of his young student Oppenheimer. But that does give you some idea of the personality of Oppenheimer, particularly at that time in his life, in his youth, very much a mercurial kind of a guy. He really was depressive enormously pedantic, chain smoked, he forgot often to eat, he was very, very difficult, he was socially awkward to say the least, and in the intellectual sense, extremely arrogant, so it was said, often talking quite bullishly over other people in seminars. He had one or two close friends, but, well, to put it mildly, he didn't always treat them particularly nicely. Apparently, when one of his friends, a guy called Francis Ferguson, quite excitedly shared the news with Oppenheimer that he'd just become engaged to marry his girlfriend, Oppenheimer leapt upon him and tried to strangle him. And well, later on, Oppenheimer, reflecting on his younger days, would say, my feeling about myself was always one of extreme discontent, uh, not to mention Oppenheimer once said, I'm the loneliest man in the world. So indeed, he was in a deeply dark moment. In fact, Oppenheimer at that time visited numerous psychoanalysts, one of whom told him he was suffering from schizophrenia. Now, that, of course, would have meant long-term institutionalization and treatment, and that's something which Oppenheimer was not able to accept. So instead, he just continued. He immersed himself in reading. He took himself on a bike tour through Corsica in a bid to ease his depression. And after this, Oppenheimer moved to Germany, uh, got a message from Linda. <laughs> Let's have a look. My father was an MP, military police officer at Los Alamos during World War II and said that Oppenheimer was a real jerk. <laughs> Linda, that seems to correlate indeed with the narrative. I mean, strangling your friend after he shares with you his happy news. <laughs> well, indeed, a difficult character, to put it very mildly. And yet interesting, too, that rather than, I mean, of course, perhaps um, one psychoanalyst's report wouldn't be sufficient for a diagnosis, but rather than take that particularly seriously, he did uh, handle things in his own way, let's say. <laughs> Remarkable, Linda. Wow, gosh. Wonder if your father has any more stories. If you can type them, I'd, I'd love to read them. And yeah, after this, like I say, Oppenheimer, in fact, moved to Germany and to study then at the University of Göttingen. And that really was one of the best centers in the world for theoretical physics, the branch of physics that tries to explain natural phenomena, tries to understand the very matter and nature of the universe itself. And curiously enough, although we had been very daunted by Cambridge, he really hit the ground running in Göttingen. He was mixing with the leading names in that field, including, of course, a name that you'll likely know, that of Werner Heisenberg, who was soon to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for the creation of quantum mechanics. And then this written, he refused your dad to say more, but did become a physicist himself after leaving the army. Wow, Linda, because of course, we'll talk about that a bit later. The army and the scientists were not quite tessellating, but they were, of course, living side by side at Los Alamos. That's remarkable, Linda. Gosh, thank you. Wow. And during his time at Göttingen, there... Oppenheimer obtained his doctorate in 1927. Again, Linda's dad said he was a real jerk. Apparently, the professor who administered the oral exam said at the end, I'm glad that's over. He was on the point of questioning me. But certainly Oppenheimer had a reason to be confident. He was already becoming reputed as one of the leading physicists in Europe over the course of two years, published 16 academic papers, at this stage researching the theoretical study of neutron stars, black holes, and really becoming one of the foremost, like I say, theoretical physicists of his time. And so at this stage, you could say American universities were really climbing over each other to recruit scholars trained at these European institutes, particularly at Göttingen. And Oppenheimer very quickly was offered a job teaching physics at Caltech in Pasadena, also one teaching at the University of California, Berkeley. And for the time, the two schools had to share him. 
talking as well about New Mexico, a place that he'd loved since youth. If you remember, he did begin to rent a cabin in New Mexico. Later on, he was able to purchase that cabin. And apparently when told that it was for sale, he said hot dog. And so he called the cabin Perro Cayente, uh, hot dog in Spanish. And then in 1929, he took up his full-time teaching work with Berkeley. And Berkeley, due really to Oppenheimer, would gain a reputation as the leading institute in the country for physics, but also due, I must say, to the, the reputation of other scientists working there at the time, including his friend Ernest Lawrence, who would later win the Nobel Prize for Physics. Now, as a teacher, well, he was not the best success at the beginning. His lectures were packed out at the beginning, but he found himself a terribly awkward communicator. He found it very hard to articulate his thoughts in any comprehensible way. He talked mostly to the board and not so much to his students. And it's said to be at the end of his first semester, only one student was left after all the rest had dropped out. But Certainly, he figured it out. He mastered teaching. A lot of his students, as the months went by, would go on to become real devotees of Oppenheimer. In fact, he became almost a cult personality at the college. They began to call him Opie. His uh, de devoted students, they adopted his body language, probably also his chain smoking, his speech patterns. They called themselves Opie's boys. And he came to really relish that. And he would stay after hours for long discussions of science, but also art, literature, languages, philology, classical uh, philosophy, Hindu mythology, for instance. And he went on still publishing extensively. He gave Berkeley a reputation as one of the world's leading centers in quantum physics research. Then in 1936, he began a relationship for the first time, this time uh, with a medical student. There would be more women later in his life and a Communist Party member called Jean Tatlock. And Tatlock encouraged him to become engaged for the first time in his life, really, in politics and the current affairs. So this was a man who had never owned a radio nor a telephone, and certainly he had the money to afford those things, but he simply had no interest or no time, really, to engage in current affairs. In fact, it's said to be being as wealthy as he was, he was rather immune to the effects of it, but it had taken him months to learn about the Great Depression, to learn about the Wall Street crash. But particularly with discussions with Tatlock, he was becoming ever more aware of the state of the world, let's say. I mean, we're talking about the mid to late 1930s here, particularly aware, of course, of the suffering of the European Jews. Now, he was, after all, from a Jewish family, albeit indeed a non-practicing Jewish family, let's say. But he was joining now a leftist discussion at Berkeley. He was becoming ever more engaged, let's say, with leftist theory. He never did join a political party, though, but his brother, Frank Oppenheimer, if you remember him, a fellow scientist to whom Robert was always very, very close. Frank did join up, it said, in those days for the Communist Party. He did become a card-carrying member. Robert said he had never voted in any election until the presidential election of 1936. He did dedicate a proportion of his salary to pledge to scientists fleeing Nazi Germany. Well, to go back to Tatlock, they had a rather tempestuous relationship. They separated in 1939. She would die five years later in 1944 under some quite mysterious circumstances, apparently suicide, although some scholars of Oppenheimer's life do believe that she might actually have been murdered. But soon after he separated from Tatlock, Oppenheimer began a relationship with Kitty Puning. She was married at the time. In fact, she was married to her third husband at that time, and she soon sought a divorce from him. And actually, she married Robert Oppenheimer on the day upon which that divorce was cleared, November 1st of 1940, and she soon thereafter became the mother of their child, Peter. Peter. 
But as we know, 1940 Europe, albeit not quite yet to the world, was at war, as we know all too well. Germany had, of course, invaded Poland on September 1st of 1939. And after six months of the so-called phony war, which followed, France, the Low Countries, had been occupied by Germany, of course, as of the spring of 1940. Atrocities against the European Jews, of course, were escalating the concentration camp network was developing rapidly. This is the Sachsenhausen camp quite near to Berlin. Then on December the 7th of 1941, as you know, Japan would launch its surprise attack against the U.S. at the U.S. naval base at, of course, Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, and the USA would abandon its neutrality, declaring war on the Japanese empire, after which Nazi Germany, as an ally of Japan, would, of course, declare war then on the USA. And now we really can talk about World War II. And now, of course, it seemed all of this theoretical research might have some serious real world application, let's say, and physicists were immediately called upon to help in the war effort. Now, initially, their first challenge was to develop a radar system. To that end, many of the top scientists in the USA would gather at the radiation laboratory initially of the Massachusetts, in Massachusetts Institute for Technology. But before too long, it was tasked to them to begin to work on the development of a nuclear bomb. Let's go back a little bit in time. Back in 1939, it had been German physicists who had discovered nuclear fission by which massive amounts of energy were able to be released. And among the earliest to recognize the enormous destructive potential this new technology had, should it be harnessed in the form of a bomb, and especially the prospect that the Germans might be able to do this first, were scientists from Hungary who had been writing to warn US President Roosevelt that the Americans would have to develop such weaponry before the Germans were able to do so. But these rather minor scientists couldn't find themselves taken particularly seriously. And of course, it was the heavyweight scientist on the left, he needs no introduction, Albert Einstein, whose attention they finally caught. And as we know, Einstein was himself a Jewish German who'd settled in the USA. Einstein was able to persuade Roosevelt at last to take action. Roosevelt set up the Advisory Committee on Uranium, stockpiling uranium, but in the end moving not quite fast enough for Roosevelt's liking as a certain panic was setting in, let's say. And this committee was then dissolved and replaced by the National Research Defense Council, the NRDC. And well, as Linda was intimating there, overseen by the US Army, of course, the director of the National Research Defense Council was Brigadier General Leslie Groves, who's going to be played, who is played, by the way, by Matt Damon in the upcoming movie Oppenheimer. Now, so as not to give away the specific purpose of this council's research, an innocuous name was dreamt up. And of course, you already know what that name was, of course, the Manhattan Project. Oppenheimer had been conducting his own research into, let's say, let's say his private research into nuclear physics for years. He was very, very keen to get involved in this project, to sign up and to play his part in protecting American security. And in 1941, Oppenheimer was invited to a top secret meeting to brainstorm indeed how a nuclear bomb might be built. And he soon found himself put in charge of a group of physicians tasked with designing such a bomb. At that stage, that particular team were not yet part of the Manhattan Project, but they officially became part of it as of July of 1943. And the Manhattan Project was based, of course, in many different locations, would have laboratories located around the USA, each with their own particular specialisms. And like I say, the biggest challenge that the project had really was how to design the bomb itself. And this design or this challenge, sorry, would really lie then primarily with Oppenheimer. <laughs> 
As Linda mentioned there, the main base, of course, was indeed Los Alamos, deserted area in New Mexico, which Oppenheimer chose. He was the one to select it. And of course, it would become his home for the next three years. An old school, abandoned, was renovated to become base camp, and then a series of barracks were constructed very rapidly to become homes for the scientists. I wouldn't say it was particularly glamorous, let's say they were particularly glamorous surroundings, but Oppenheimer was really scouring the country, seeking out the best scientists for this project. Some, of course, were former students of his own. Some, indeed, were refugees having fled Europe, having fled Nazi. Germany in particular. Oppenheimer initially sought out 30 scientists, 30 scholars, but far more than that volunteered their service. And so by the end of World War II, there would have been something close to 6,000 people living at Los Alamos working on the project, but also those who'd brought their families in too, and really maintaining full energy devotion to this project, despite the terrible heat, no doubt, and like I say, rather rudimentary living conditions. But what was maybe even more difficult for some than the environment itself was the constant surveillance by the army. So Oppenheimer was certainly kept under very close observation at this time. He had really no privacy. His phone was tapped, his letters were read, and he was constantly being followed. So he had an awful lot of demands placed upon him, not least this surveillance, but also the fact that he really was the mediator, let's say, between the scientists themselves and the army. But Oppenheimer did not lose um, his energy, let's say. He constantly was reminding himself and his scientists not to despair, to keep the bigger picture in mind that they were involved in a struggle for the very future of mankind. And well, as we know, by February 1945, indeed, the scientists at Los Alamos had come up with, of course, two different designs for the atomic bomb. And I think you'll know what they were codenamed. Of course, there was Little Boy and Fat Man. Little Boy was uranium-based, Fat Man plutonium-based. The scientists were really very confident about little boy. They said, that's the one. He didn't even need to be tested. They were a little bit less secure about Fat Man. And so Oppenheimer decided to test Fat Man at Alamogordo in New Mexico, about 100 square miles of desolate landscape. They had to wait a terribly long time for the right atmospheric conditions, particularly for the wind to be traveling in the right direction. As you can imagine, Oppenheimer grew very anxious, of course, about fallout. But in the end, the bomb would be tested, Fat Man, on July 16th, 1945, in the so-called Trinity test. And the flash of this bomb could be seen from three states away, it is said. The mushroom cloud rose 38,000 feet into the air, and the crater it formed was a half mile wide. Apparently, watching this test, the other scientists cheered enthusiastically, but Oppenheimer himself grew very, very quickly, very deeply troubled. And you might know it's then that he first utters this famous quote he makes from the Hindu text, Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita, sorry, um, I, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I'm sure you've heard him say that in TV footage as well. But well, by now, the decision whether or not to make use of these bombs was, of course, well, it never had been in Oppenheimer's hands, but was squarely by now in the hands of President Truman. And it was on his journey back to the USA from the Potsdam Conference near to Berlin the final conference of the Allied powers of World War II, that Truman made the decision to indeed drop the bomb. Now, okay, not to perplex you too much, I think you'll know this, but just for the sake of clarity, of course, the European theater, as it's called, of war was over. Germany, of course, had surrendered as of VE Day. And so after the series of these conferences held in place like Yalta, Casablanca, the Allies meet once more, and this time in Potsdam. They couldn't meet in Berlin because of Berlin's destruction during the war, but at Potsdam in a palace near to Berlin, Berlin, Truman met with Churchill initially, then Clement Attlee, the two British prime ministers of the day, and of course with Stalin. 
Now, like I say, on his way back home, and Stalin was deeply, indeed, shocked, so it is said, at least, when he understood Truman's decision-making. Well, Truman shows then to have the US B-29 bomber, the Enola Gay, drop little boy over the city of Hiroshima on the 6th of August, 1945. And of course, we know all too well the, the consequences of that, that 90% of the buildings in Hiroshima were instantly destroyed and 66,000 people would die. So this remains to be, hopefully never to be surpassed, the most devastating day in human history, we must say, with the highest death toll of any singular day. Yet the immediate Japanese response, the immediate response from Emperor Hirohito was not, as you know, immediate surrender. And so three days thereafter, on the 9th of August, 1945, of course, um, Fat Man was dropped over the city of Nagasaki, and that would kill 42,000 people. Whereupon, on August 14th, at last, Emperor Hirohito did announce the Japanese surrender. So what about Oppenheimer and, well, our title is Legacy. When learning that the bombs had brought about, let's say, indeed, the desired effect, the surrender of Japan, yes, Oppenheimer did celebrate with the rest of the nation, but, of course, soon came to reflect upon what his project had really unleashed upon the world. And on August the 16th of 1945, he relinquished his position at Los Alamos. He went back to teaching, this time at Princeton, but after three years out there in Los Alamos, he really was struggling with this relatively mundane job. But as information about the Manhattan Project was entering the public domain, he was becoming something of a celebrity. He took up lecturing around the country, and of course he did talk about what he thought the USA should do with its newfound nuclear technology. And Oppenheimer felt a strong responsibility, of course, to ensure that the future use of nuclear energy would be for good and not for evil. He did advocate for international sanctions on the use of nuclear power, but to that end, really to no avail. Now, as we know, really, even you might say before those two bombs were dropped upon Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Soviet Union had, of course, emerged already as an enemy of the Western allies, even though they sat together at the Potsdam conference, the tension between them was high. And you know all too well that the Cold War and the ensuing arms race would begin, well, if not already before the Japanese surrender, certainly immediately thereafter, let's say. Of course, the Americans had the nuclear advantage that was all too clear, but the Soviets would have a test of their own in late 1949, and apparently that said this, it, it, it said that that profoundly surprised the USA. It did also lead to beliefs that perhaps spies had shared vital information with the Soviets, and due to his former dalliances with leftism, Oppenheimer did immediately really come under suspicion after that Soviet nuclear test in 1949. When he had filled in his personal security questionnaire for clearance back in 1942, apparently Oppenheimer had written he was a member of just about every communist front organization on the West Coast, which of course he later said was simply a preposterous joke. But word was beginning to spread now through the 1950s about weaponry far, far more powerful than that which had been deployed over Japan. Uh, and really, as early as 1952, the concept of a bomb 1,000 times more powerful than that dropped upon both Nagasaki and Hiroshima was, uh, well, all too clearly evident, let's say, the hydrogen bomb, the prospect of which Oppenheimer vehemently opposed. He saw the hydrogen bomb as a potential weapon for genocide, but with President Truman adamant to continue the hydrogen bomb, Mike was tested in 1952. In November of 1953, the FBI received a letter from a former government official alleging that Oppenheimer was indeed a Soviet spy. He then found himself one of the central targets of McCarthy's witch hunt, as it was known. His security clearance, of course, was immediately revoked, and it was clear he was really being investigated for his opposition to Mike to the testing of that hydrogen bomb, but he was nevertheless permanently now shut out 
of any involvement in um, future government projects with an investigative report citing proof of fundamental defects in his character. And by 1963, he would be somewhat rehabilitated. He was decorated in that year with the Enrico Fermi Award for Excellence in Nuclear Research, but he certainly never did recover from the humiliation he had sustained through the 50s. And Oppenheimer passed away on the 18th of February 1967 of throat cancer at the age of 62. I wanted just to maybe finish with a couple of extra points to you. I wanted to mention the name of this man, Fritz Haber. It may be a name familiar to you. He may be new to you, but Fritz Haber was a German chemist. He received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1918 for having invented what was called the Haber-Bosch method or the Haber-Bosch process. That was a method that could synthesize ammonia from nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas. And well, that science is rather be beyond my comprehension, but it's very significant in terms of synthesizing fertilizers. And so it's said to be that even today, perhaps about a third of annual global food production would deploy this Haber-Bosch process. But in the early part of the 20th century, certainly this was something by which much of the world's population was being indeed supported in the developing world as we, as we refer to it. And so by that, I want to say Fritz Haber is remembered for having done something very, very good, but is also remembered for having done something really very, very bad, let's say. Mm, he was known as the father of chemical warfare. He is the one who would develop in the end chlorine gas, which of course was deployed, as we know, during the First World War. And it was Haber who first proposed the use of this chlorine gas uh, to break deadlocks and stalemates, let's call them like that, during the First World War. In fact, well, an element of this story to mention is that having synthesized this chlorine gas and being so very proud of it, in fact, on the night before Fritz Haber would leave for the first gas attack of World War I on the Eastern Front in 1915, his wife, and this really is, I believe, in horror at her husband's invention, would kill herself. She shot herself with her husband's own pistol. Now, Haber had no involvement in what would come later, but it was his work, it was his research, which would then be used to develop Cyclone B, as it was called, and used for the murder of certainly over one million Jewish people in the gas chambers of Auschwitz-Birkenau, and it is believed also Majdanek. Of course, the death toll is much, much higher than that. I just mean in terms of this specific gas there were other methods that same uh, deployed in the gas chambers, most usually exhaust fumes. But the very notion of murdering people with gas is something that, of course, the Nazis really inherited from World War I, let's say. And so it's a very peculiar thing that on one hand, Fritz Haber did so much good for the world, and on the other, did something so absolutely devastating. And he was himself from a Jewish family. So after the Nazis would rise to power, he also was expelled from his position in the academy. Academy of Science in Berlin due to his Judaism. He died in 1934. I just wanted to mention that name to you, but really to finish, I thought it's a very much side note, but just should you be a fan of the actor Killian Murphy, whose face we saw earlier, the guy who's playing Oppenheimer in the upcoming movie, just for you to know that if you are a fan of that Irish actor, there is another movie about World War II in which he stars that you might really like, a different director, not a Christopher Nolan movie, but a movie called Anthropoid and Anthropoid is a very, very different theme indeed, but it's about the assassination of one of Hitler's upper echelon guys, Reinhard Heydrich, in many respects, the father of the Holocaust, you might say, the chair of the Wannsee Conference, who was assassinated in Prague in 1942, quite soon after that conference, by two Czechoslovak agents, and actually two Irish actors play those two men, Jimmy Dornan and indeed Killian Murphy. But I hope you might have a chance to watch Anthropoid and, of course, perhaps have a chance to watch Oppenheimer when it's premiered in a couple of weeks. But I really hope that you enjoyed this very short and very unscientific, forgive me, introduction to J. Robert Oppenheimer's life and career. 
and I'd love to see you soon for another talk. So perhaps you can join me tomorrow at the same time for a discussion of the female perpetrators of the Holocaust on Context Conversations. And thanks so much, Seku, for putting a link for you there into the chat. So if anybody would like to join a future conversation with me, then yes, please do. Uh, Linda, thanks a whole lot. Thank you for your contribution how incredible gosh and yeah i, I can imagine a, a real jerk most likely was indeed an accurate description but a very complex as you see and nuanced man and well i hope you find it of interest to learn a little bit more about him thanks so much catherine thank you sue thanks so much it's my pleasure to spend time with you and yes i hope to see you again maybe even tomorrow or very soon thank you karen so much thanks everybody always welcome always a delight to be with you and thank you seku for hosting and well i'll just see you next time i suppose good evening everybody have a wonderful evening whatever you do and see you soon <laughs> thanks a whole lot Thanks, Finn, for a lovely lecture. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, yeah, I did put a link in the chat for those upcoming lectures with Finn, as well as Finn's expert club. So definitely check that out. And uh, Finn, thank you again. It was great to see you, and I hope to see you again soon. Uh, have a great rest of your days and evening.